Why are we sitting here meditating when we could be out doing other things? It's because we've seen that there are some forms of happiness that are truer than others, more long-lasting, that go deeper into the heart. And we want that happiness. We often hear that Buddhism is down on desires and wanting, but that's not true. The desire for true happiness, for long-lasting happiness, the Buddha said, is the beginning of wisdom. We've seen the kind of happiness that sights, smells, tastes, sounds, tactical sensations can give to us. We have a sense that it's not enough. We want something that's deeper, more long-lasting. And as the Buddha said, if, there's, if you see there's a greater happiness that comes from abandoning a lesser happiness, be willing to abandon the lesser happiness for the sake of the greater one. This is the principle that underlies all of his teachings. Years back when I was in Thailand, I had to take a series of exams for monks. And part of the exam was to write a little Dharma talk, and you were supposed to quote a few Buddhist sayings in the course of the Dharma talk. And they gave you a, a whole book that you could memorize if you wanted to. And you'd see little novices out memorizing the whole book. But instead of memorizing the whole book, I decided to take a few sayings that could be used in any situation. They would give you a topic to write on. And so I figured memorize just a few statements that would cover any possible topic. And one of them was just that. If you see a greater happiness that comes from abandoning a lesser happiness, be willing to abandon the lesser one for the sake of the greater one. That's a principle that underlies everything in our lives. The Buddha once said, if you, when you go to see a, a wise person, that's the question you should ask. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What do I have to abandon to find that long-term welfare and happiness? What do I have to do? Well, one of the things is learning to develop mindfulness and alertness, concentration, discernment in the mind, which is what we're working on here. But the principle applies in all areas of our lives. And it's important to remember that, because many times we get short-sighted. Events happen and we say, well, this is a special event. We know the basic principles of morality. We know the principles of generosity. And yet certain incident, incidents come up and we say, well, this is a time when we can put those very nice teachings aside because this is a more difficult situation. It's precisely because of situations like this that the Buddha has us take the precepts seriously. Remind ourselves that there are no exceptions for the basic principles of morality. No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no taking of intoxicants. It's like going into the wilderness. They give you a lot of things to memorize before you go out. When you meet a bear, don't run. They keep it short and simple, and they say no exceptions for that one. There are other principles that are sensitive to the situation, but there are few that are true across the board. So they keep them short and simple because the last thing you want to think of when you see a bear is that you're not going to run. And yet that's precisely what you have to remember. It's the same with the precepts. You keep them in mind all the time. And you live by them because you realize that by following the precepts you will lead to a longer-term happiness, deeper happiness, than could be found by breaking the precepts. There's all kinds of arguments for breaking the precepts. Say, well, if I don't lie this time, then I might lose money. This might happen, that might happen. I say they're extenuating circumstances. Maybe this is the time to use torture. Maybe this is the time to do this, do that. All the things that we know we shouldn't do. But when we get scared, when we get concerned about our survival, we say, all of a sudden, okay, there's Precepts get thrown out the window. That's precisely the thing we should not do. That's taking a long-term happiness and throwing it away for the sake of a short-term happiness. It doesn't work. 
So we stick with the precepts, no matter what. This requires faith, because sometimes it's going to take a while for that long-term happiness to show up. But at the very least, when you do the right thing, when you do the honorable thing, no matter what, you've got that sense of well-being right there. There's a sense of dignity, there's a sense of nobility. nobility. Last month when I was presiding at my father's funeral, one of the final points I made was that the whole purpose of a funeral is to remind ourselves that death does not negate the honorable and valuable parts of human life. Just because death can happen doesn't mean we should act in dishonorable ways. Just because death happens doesn't mean that life has no value. Then we come right down to it. There, there are four reasons why people would break the precepts and would go against the principles of what they know is right. Four forms of bias, and bias in terms of people you like, bias in terms of aversion of certain people you don't like, so you mistreat them, or there are other people you do like and you're willing to break the precepts for their sake. There are cases when you're confused, deluded. And the big one is the fourth one, fear. And ultimately fear comes down to fear of death. And so to protect ourselves from that possibility that our fear will cause us to do things that are really harmful for ourselves and other people, we have to undercut the causes for the fear of death. This is one of the reasons why we meditate. The Buddha outlines four basic causes. One is attachment to sensual pleasures, thinking this is the only real happiness we can have in life, so we've got to hold on to them as much as we can. Second one is attachment to your body, thinking that if the body goes, that's the end. Third is knowledge that you've done something cruel. And there's a possibility that after death you may be punished for doing things that are cruel. That makes you fear death. And the fourth one is not seeing the true Dharma, not realizing that there is a deathless element in the mind that's not touched by any of these things, that's not touched by death aging, illness, or death. That part of the mind that has nothing to fear. So we work on these four issues in the meditation. One, by developing a sense of ease that doesn't depend on sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. It depends simply on the stillness of the mind. You focus on the breath in such a way that you relate easily to the breath. It feels comfortable being with the breath coming in, with the breath going out. And you allow yourself to stay there. After all, stillness is the essence of happiness. There's another passage where the Buddha said, there is no happiness other than peace. That's what he means. The mind will know no happiness unless it can settle down and be still. So you give it a good place to stay. The longer you stay here, the more solid this inner sense of stillness becomes. The more you can detach yourself from your fierce attachment to Sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, all the sensory things outside that everybody likes. Everybody's afraid to give up. And it's because of that fear they do all kinds of evil things. Short-sighted things, selfish things, things that are in their long-term bad interest, not lack long-term detriment. That's one issue we work on. The next one is attachment to the body. Learn how to contemplate the body you've got here. What is it that's really worthy of attachment? Take it apart, section by section by section. And you realize that it's, you can't take the body as an end in and of itself, because after all it's going to die. In the meantime, it's going to get sick. You have to look after it, but it, it is a tool. But we go beyond that. We have some strong sense that it's us or it's ours, and that we could not survive without it. But as the mind gets more and more still, there is a sense of awareness that separates itself out from the body. And even just that level of understanding, that level of awareness in your, in your concentration practice is enough to show you that you don't have to identify with the body. It's habitual, and we tend to do it, but it's not necessary. So we're not contemplating the body because we're trying to badmouth it, but simply that because learning to detach yourself from it brings so much more happiness, so much more peace. 
undercuts one of the major causes of fear. As for the third cause of fear, if you know that you have done bad things in the past, he doesn't tell you to. He tells you don't dwell on them. Simply resolve that you're not going to do them again, and develop an attitude of goodwill for yourself, for all beings around you. If you can maintain that goodwill, then it gets harder and harder to say hurtful things, do hurtful things, because you wonder, what are you going to get out of being hurtful to other people? It only comes back at you. It's like spitting in the wind. When you spit in the wind, who gets spat upon? Well, you get spat upon. It all keeps coming back. But again, it's does no good to dwell on past mistakes, aside simply from remembering that they were mistakes and you're not going to do them again. In the meantime, developing an attitude of goodwill can also help mitigate the effect of karmic effect of past mistakes. We talked about this yesterday, the, the crystal of salt. You put it in a glass of water, you can't drink the water. You put it in an ocean, excuse me, you put it in a lake, you can still drink the water. Because there's so much more water than salt. Try to make your mind like a lake, like a huge river. And you find that there's less and less to fear. And the final issue is seeing the true Dharma. What this means is as you work through all the attachments in the mind, as you peel them away one by one by one attachment, not only to the body but to feelings, to your mental labels, your thought constructs. Even sensory consciousness, things open up in the mind. You find that there's a deathless element or a deathless dimension there in the mind, or it's touched at the mind. And when you see that, you see there's really nothing to fear. There's no need to identify with any of the things that die, because there is this as well. In fact, this is something special, it's not touched by anything. And it's not annihilation. The body can die, but this doesn't. So it's in this way that meditation overcomes our fear. Because if you're not afraid of death, what are you going to be afraid of? The only thing that's less is being afraid of doing the wrong thing. But you've undercut all the reasons for doing the wrong, the wrong thing. Desire, aversion, delusion, fear, these all get undercut. In this way, there's no reason to do anything that's going to be against your long-term welfare and happiness. And so at this point, you no, no longer have to go on faith. You see that the, what the Buddha said is true. If you stick by the precepts, stick by his teachings, the results will have to be a true happiness. But until you can see that for yourself, it's wise to take it on faith and to hold to that. This is how, what's meant by taking refuge. Place your trust. And what are you placing your trust in? The principle that what is good and noble is going to lead to happiness. That's a good thing to trust. There's a sense of rightness about that trust. It's simply when we let ourselves get carried away by our fears and our other biases, we let ourselves get pulled away. And there's a sense of being lost when you do that. So no matter what happens, always hold to what you know is good and right and noble. And although there may be hardships in the short term, they're more than made up by the trueness and the depth of the happiness in the long term. <laughs>